everyone, it's Ross Anderson here from the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show with episode number two of Meet the Boutique Winemakers, and this is the trophy edition. Now, as many of you know, we ran the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show just over two weeks ago, and we had an amazing participation rate uh, considering the challenges that we've all faced in 2020. Uh, the past two weeks post-show have been an overload of administration, uh, generating results, distributing this out to the winemakers and the participants uh, across Australia and New Zealand, uh, and all the other aspects that come along uh, with running this amazing show. Now, the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show is celebrating 25 years this year of supporting the small winemakers of Australia and New Zealand. And the, as always, the aim of these interviews is to inform, entertain and educate you on all things boutique and share the stories and the personalities behind the brands, which are the heartbeat of Australian and New Zealand wine. Now, on to today's interview. Uh, it's fair to say that today's guest is one of Australia's finest winemakers. Uh, born and bred in the Barossa into a winemaking family, the vine was never far, even at a young age. A self-confessed sports tragic, um, with a love of Merv Hughes meets David Boone style moustaches, but um, that's not just necessarily for Movember. Um, our guest has developed a side project, which is second to none. His wines are anchored in Riesling, uh, but include Grenache, Shiraz and Red Blends. And these wines all pack a punch and compete at the highest level year on year and are amazing value for money. I'm delighted to have uh, Steve Baraglia from Naked Run Wines joining us this morning. And I'm just going to pop him into the discussion here. Good morning, Steve. How are you? I'm good, Ross. How are you? I'm living the dream. I just had a quick look at your beautiful setup down in the Clare Valley and uh, it's a bit overcast and murky in Sydney today. Uh, but you've got beautiful sunshine, blue skies, and you're standing out almost in the vineyards. Yeah, no, we have a, we've got a lovely day today, so it's um, looking good here in uh, spring in Clare at the moment. Yeah, great. And you're on site at the Pikes Vineyards at the moment? Yeah, we're um, uh, down here, in, I mean, uh, uh, down on the creek line of one of the Pikes blocks, so um, in work, at work today. So, um, yeah, just looking at some wines on the bench, which is always interesting. Lovely, lovely. So that's today's to-do list, looking at wines on the bench. <laughs> and I'm stuck in administration hell. <laughs> so tell us, Steve, um, how are things down in, in Clare Valley? Uh, what impact did lockdown have and um, has that changed operations on the farm moving forward or not really? Uh, a little bit, changed a little bit. So initially when we went into lockdown, it was right at the end of our vintage period. So um, we, we we get a lot of international um travelers that come on as um uh, vintage casual so we had to um get them sent back to their countries of origin pretty quick smart when that all happened so we went back to a small team and and uh we decided to go into um two teams of uh, uh three workers um and we just worked long days from there so um which worked quite well through that period and and then obviously South Australia had some really good results and we managed to come out of that um, relatively unscathed. But yeah, it was sort of business as usual when you when you're in vintage, you're in your you're in your own sort of lockdown world anyway. Did you uh, use that lockdown time to do anything new or look at anything new in your operation? Uh, that um, that period after vintage is just so hectic with just making sure that all the wines are sound and making sure that um, uh, things are progressing to where bottling um programs and um and getting things in the in the right zone for um classification so uh nothing really changed for us too much we're we're in we're a rural setting we're sort of an hour and a half north of adelaide which um uh gives us a gives us a little bit of a barrier between us, us the suburbs so it's, it's it's actually quite nice and do you feel that consumer confidence is returning um, I guess following, um, following the, the lockdown and the initial impact, it was, a, it was almost a little bit sort of panic type mode, but, um, I guess what we've seen in South Australia, the bounce back has been incredible and restaurants and, um, bars and pubs have, have, um, proceeded to, to have really good numbers through and, and sales are actually trending in a really good spot. So, yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, we're getting the same sort of feedback across the nation from people I'm speaking to. 
it seems to be a similar vein of thought there, which is great. But I guess, like, let's move on to one of the main reasons for, for dialing into uh, in with you today is this bad boy over here. Naked Run, Hill 5, Shiraz Cabernet 2019, which picked up the trophy uh, for the Red Blends category, uh, Red Blend and Roan Blend varietals. Uh, congratulations on that yet again. Another win for Naked Run. Uh, last year, what did you win last year? Was it Riesling last year? No, we had, we had nothing last year. Riesling the year before that. So year before, yeah. and then you've, you've got a bit of a track record. There was um, was it the place in time generally does quite well here. The, the Aldo does quite well here. All your wines have generally done well over the last five, six, seven years that you've been entering. Um, yeah, so we, um, we just make the wines how we like to drink them, and if they do well, they do well. So um, just about what we like to drink, I guess. <laughs> Um, is there anything specifically special that happened in this uh, 2019 vintage on Hill 5 uh, that you can tell us about? Yeah, I guess clear generally in, in 2019 was a bit um, uh, quite dry and a, a little bit warmer than average, um, but we've converted our Shiraz um, past all of this particular blend across to cane pruned um, uh, back in 2017, and we've had excellent results with the changing pruning method. We're having the vines growing um, smaller in size, the, the the fruits hanging in a better position, and we're and we're getting better concentration of flavour, and producing uh, what I think is better wine. So, um, most of our attention is all about the vineyard and making sure we grow healthy, balanced vines. And um, this change in pruning methods definitely work for us for this for, for this variety. So, um, we blend uh, this year. It was fifty seven percent Shiraz, forty three percent Cab, and the, the Shiraz adds the dark fruits and and the power and the cabernet add some more perfume and uh, cassis and and structure to the wine and they just married it's just a lovely marriage and they um, work really well together fantastic yeah yeah we, we, we we're quite used to seeing you um dominate in the riesling which is what you generally do and i know you have a very soft spot for riesling and we'll get to that in a minute but um can you tell us a bit about your personal story and your journey in wine and when did it start and uh, have you worked any overseas vintages yeah, I guess um, I guess I grew up in a great growing family. So my um, uh, father um, tended to a little plot of land in Williamstown, um, with which was planted by his his father, my grandfather, when he came out from Italy uh, around about eighty years ago. So um, that's where our little Grenache blend comes from, uh, the Eldo, named after my dad, and um, that's sort of where I really started interest in great growing, and then. Um, moved into the winemaking um, degree uh, post high school and then uh, finished at Pikes pretty much straight after the degree. And I guess I didn't actually get a chance to do overseas vintages because I was always involved with um, team sports. But um, I guess what that has allowed me to do is um, understand more of what we what, what I've been working with. So I've been at Pikes since 2003, so really trying to understand how each block works and what we need to do to create better to grow better fruit to create better wines so you moved out of a degree at adelaide university and straight into a job at pikes yep straight into a job at pikes i just went in as a seller hand and and progressed through the ranks and now i'm currently chief winemaker so been here a while but um i uh, really enjoy what we do and who were you working under who was who was the winemaker or the, or the person that was passing down the knowledge to you at that time I had a couple of um, people uh, that I got a great amount of knowledge of from. Um, Neil Pike, uh, the founder and owner who's just retired um, last year, is, he's gave me a wealth of knowledge. Plus, um, the initial senior winemaker at the time, John Trotter, um, gave me uh, a good insight into uh, what we do and, and, and how things happen. So, no, it's been a really good uh, mentor and ship and... Um, uh, come out of it really well with a vast amount of knowledge and still learning, always learning. And then in 2005, uh, Jamie and Brad, friends of yours, you've got together and you've formed Naked Run. Uh, what was the motivation behind this? I guess uh, we all went to university together, um, studied winemaker, winemaking and viticulture and, and, and decided to just have something that gives us uh, entirely control over what we do. So... Um, I purchased a little vineyard with my wife back in 2005, so 
um, at Clare. So that gave us um, control of a, a Clare vineyard. We had the Williamstown vineyard and, and Brad's a viticulturalist in the Barossa. So we had um, uh, a good selection of Shiraz fruit to choose from from there. So it gave us, um, we got a good thing that we've got is total control from the vineyard all the way through the winemaking process, which is very, very important, I think. And um, so you operate these three vineyard sites, which you've mentioned, uh, uh, Williamstown and Greenock in the Barossa and uh, Seven Hill in the Clare. And I've just got a map of, uh, there's Greenock coming up on the on the screen. Um, so how big is Greenock in general? It's not all that big, is it? It's only, a, it's one of the smaller towns in the Barossa. So it's on the sort of northern, northern end. Uh, it's relatively hot, high in altitude for the Barossa. It sort of flows down to the Barossa floor through that Nuri Upta and Tanunda region, um, but uh, got some really good sites. It's um, generally produces sort of earthy dark reds um, from that from that particular zone. Um, but uh, yeah, we've taken fruit from a couple of different uh, sub regions, and and uh, we've consistently been taking this stuff from Grenock. And then your, your vineyard at um, Seven Hill. I've got another map and I've reversed the map upside down. So Adelaide's in the north and I just took it to give perspective for people that are not too sure where the area is so they can, they can see that distance. Um, and what I noticed where the, the tags are on the screen for Seven Hill, there seems to be a lot of ridge or, or, or uh, elevation coming through. Is that the case in Seven Hill? Yeah, the, the thing about Clare is that it is relatively elevated. So um, our particular vineyards about four four seventy five meters above sea level um and this elevation allows us to have um higher winter we get most of our rainfall in winter so we generally get higher winter rainfalls in other parts of clare so the north and south of the valley which is um a little bit lower in altitude can sort of be four to six inches below um uh in rainfall compared to what we get and we think that extra rainfall allows us to grow healthy vines really great for riesling but our reds are more medium bodied in styles and um too fuller full, fuller bodied and we just make what what our vineyard produces and then you said the um, the williamstown vineyard was around about 80 years old and, and is in the family but what about the seven hill and the um the Greenock property are, are they quite old uh, vineyards do you know much about the history of them yeah, well, the uh, our Clare Vineyard was um, in, in original plantings only went in two thousand, so we've got uh, the, the Shiraz block and a Riesling block went in in two thousand, and we grafted part of the initial Riesling block to Cabernet because there was a a pocket that got frosted, um, so we we converted that to to Cabernet. Um, we actually planted our our best Riesling block. We planted in two thousand six, just after we purchased the property. And that's on a lovely eastern slope with east-west rows and it and consistently produces great fruit flavour and, and really high natural acidity. So um, that's uh, that's a little bit of the history there. And, and the Greenock property is not relatively, it's, no, it's nowhere near as old as um, uh, the Williamstown uh, block, but there is a couple of older plantings on this particular property. Um, I guess most of, a lot of the brossa was planted up sort of in the in the 90s and into the 2000s when the wine industry sort of took off again so um a lot of those vines are sort of now that sort of 20 25 years old and producing consistently good fruit so yeah and the results speak for themselves tell us a bit about the uh, bwc shiraz what does bwc stand for this one uh, on so the this, now. this was the wine where we uh, we decided to name it after ourselves, so it's uh, just in. <laughs> I wondered if that was the case. <laughs> <laughs> of our last names, Brackley Wood and Curry. So, um, <laughs> I guess that was around about the Maccabi Diva type stage in 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 life. So we we went with that, and we've continued to go with that. So. And uh, does is the wine? Um, I don't have it with me today, but is is the wine similar uh, Barossa style, or is it um, you know that big fruity style, or, or are, you, are you doing something different there? Uh, generally, right, packs, packs a bit of fruit. We we hand pick it and then we destem it. So we incorporate some whole bunch into our ferments. Um, so I think we're we we're not as we don't we're definitely not as big as a lot of the brossa. We we're sort of meat embodied in style, but um, yeah, that those, that whole berry fermentation gives you sort of some of that partial carbonic maceration character, and then you get some of those sinewy tannins from the the stems in the ferment, which adds another uh, layer to the wine. So 
um, yeah, a little bit different, but there's, there is a lot of producers that are, are using a whole bunch and, and whole berry ferments in their, in their Barossa Shiraz too. So. Fantastic. Question for you. Um, I've noticed in, uh, in the last couple of years, an increase in uh, entries into the other reds and other whites classes, you know, like Sangiovese, Tempranillo, uh, a lot more Mataro, a lot more Grenache coming through. Um, what are your observations in this regards to what's happening on the ground in, in the Barossa and, and even in the Clare Valley? Do you, are you seeing more of these alternate varieties coming through? Yeah, well, I think that, uh, I guess, coming from uh, my, my Pike's background, we've been experimenting for with alternative varieties for a number of years and, that, and um, we've actually got the second planting of Sangiovese in Australia after Coriol. Um, and I think overall we crush about 26 different varieties across um, three regions. So, um, yeah, we were always experimenting with different things and sometimes things don't work, but if something shows well and, and you think it's um, good enough to be bottled off as a single bottling, we, we, we've been doing that. So um, I think other producers are the same. It gives you a, a different um, point. It gives you a point of difference to, to others in the marketplace and um, some varieties some varieties work and some varieties don't, but you've got to give them a chance. Yeah. We've noticed a, a dramatic increase in the number of Grenache entries. Um, and everyone I'm talking to is, there seems to be a lot of interest in Grenache and, and renewed interest, uh, which is great. So fingers crossed on that, especially in the McLaren Valley area as well with Rob Mack at Aphelion and, and those guys pushing that, that, that Grenache growth. Um, so I'm yeah. not what's happening yeah. in your area, but yeah. Yeah, Grenache has been a big push as well. Consumers are becoming more aware of it and there is some great old vine plantings in the Barossa and McLaren Vale and Clare um, that probably have been blended away into blends over time, but now people have... Um, the push away from mm -hmm. big big reds has, has, has brought, a, brought a new wave of fresh, vibrant, um, fruit-driven wines and Grenache is one of those varieties that fits the bill really well. Let's talk about your, I believe it's your favourite variety, Riesling. So you make three Rieslings on site. We've got the place in time and then we've got the uh, first. And you also make uh, another Riesling. Uh, it's got a German sort of name to it. Tell us about your Rieslings. Yeah, I guess um, with my Pikes background, I, I, I find that Riesling is the variety that um, shows its place the best from any variety it has minimal winemaking influence and it's just about capturing the vineyard and getting it into bottle um our first is is it does that so it's about um perfume and and citrus and florals uh, delicately balanced with really lovely natural acidity um great drink now but also will live for a long time but we release it early um our place in time riesling is specifically only made from really good vintages and we we hold it back with some um, bottle age sort of four to five years before we actually release it to showcase what riesling does so it develops more of those marmalade buttered toast type characters um and fills out in the palate and has a softness about them um and uh, and will continue to to grow in the bottle um and our desweet is our sort of a a take on a, a germanic inspired sort of cabinet um riesling which which is lower in alcohol so generally sort of eight to nine percent alcohol but carries about 40 grams of sugar and has really good acid to cut through that uh, that sugar so really sort of great wines for sort of spicy food and um yeah just something a little bit different and which variety do you enjoy working with the most i I, I like making Riesling. Yeah, definitely I like Riesling, but there's other varieties I really like. I like Chardonnay and Pinot and um, definitely like Grenache and Shiraz. It's just, just um, yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah, there's plenty of plenty of variation that you like. So, And what would you say is your flagship? Is it Riesling, Naked Run? Oh, it's definitely our Riesling, yeah. No, we, we've, um, uh, it's the biggest volume wine we make. Even though we're still small, it's still a single vineyard, it's still a single block. It's, um, one yeah. ferment um, there's nowhere to hide if you get it wrong so you got to have <laughs> the attention to detail in the uh, the what in the vineyard and then in the winery following so if you happen to get it wrong there's nowhere to hide so yeah. and you have a very strong record of success especially as I mentioned uh, in the in the boutique wine show are you doing anything different something that sets you apart do you believe I mean you've mentioned that it all happens in the vineyard and you, you really focus on that is that the secret I think it's just something vineyard. Else? yep it's 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 just 
it's the little things that happen and it's the timing and it's just getting things right um keeping keeping the vines as healthy as possible um so they can produce great flavor and, and high natural acidity so um we tend to be really we're really consistent in this particular block we've been making our riesling from um in the last sort of five or six years have been producing year in year out really consistent fruit and um it's just it just makes the job a lot easier in the winery when when you've got that is there anything you can perhaps share with us on future plans at, at naked run i mean you, you've just mentioned you enjoyed making chardonnay and uh, pinot noir is that something that could be in in the mix in the future or you, you're not too sure at yeah. the moment no we're just, just sort of ticking along at the moment I guess, I guess one thing we i am in the process of is planting a new vineyard so i've got another two hectares of vines going in this year so um i've got some um a new clone of riesling to go in uh, that i haven't got planted um gm 110 so that'll be really interesting to see how that takes to our site and i'm also planting just a small acre block of um some Mataro. so i took some cuttings from Wendere, so um oh, wow. when uh, they're up and running in sort of three years it'll be interesting to see what we do with that if we make it into a a, a dry red style but mataro is a variety um in clear that you can get lovely spice and pepper characters when um uh things just go right so yeah hopefully we can get that those sort of characters come through and so here's a here's an out of there question if you weren't a winemaker what do you think your career path could have been like what were your interests uh i know tough question <laughs> um <laughs> i don't know i was i was always quite hand i uh, quite hands-on so i like um making things so uh making furniture or being involved as a personal trainer or something along those lines maybe so but um i guess i guess like everyone if you find something that you really like doing it's not really like going to work you you just like doing what you do so um, wine making's that growing those grapes and seeing what it looks like in the in the bottle for the finished um, uh, finished product. And can you share with us your favourite wine memory? Not necessarily a naked run memory, but is there a favourite wine memory? It can be obscene, it can be off the charts. Is there something that always sticks in your mind, makes you smile? Oh, yeah, I just like sharing good wine, a good bottle of wine with friends, and uh, and and just being able to sit down and enjoy the conversation. So. Um, yeah sort of uh nothing really sticks out of the 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 greatness or in the the one moment of inspiration but um yeah it's just it's just being able to listen to people talk about wine and enjoying what they have to say um rob mack over at uh aphelion uh we've judged with him he's judged the show with us and um he's the only person i've ever met that judges with his earphones on his bose earphones on and he likes to just block out all those distractions and I watched him for a good number of hours while he was doing that. And I said to him, what are you listening to? And he was, so it went anything from the Dandy Warhols through to Tool, through to Stoner Rock. Um, and it's how he also blends and does his things in the winery when, he, when, he's, when he's putting his blends together. Do you listen to music? What are you listening to at the moment? Do you think it has a place in, in, in these environments? Yeah, I, I do a, a, a bit of judging myself. Uh, I don't listen to music when I'm judging or when I'm making blends, but I, I definitely listen to plenty of music when I'm out in the vineyard doing uh, different vineyard operations. So I, um, I like, I still listen to the old things. I listen to a lot of Triple J, Hottest 100s. I listen to Pearl Jam. I, I enjoy that, but also like um, listening to Dr. Carl on a Thursday morning. So. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's all I wanted to know for now, Steve. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. I know you're out there in what looks like a really hard environment. Can you show us the vines again? Can you just turn your camera around so everyone can get a look at that? How's this for the office? That's just shocking. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't show you mine. It's a. It's a. It's a melee of wine bottles and boxes at the moment. But um, yeah, such is such is life. Steve, thank you so much for joining us from the beautiful Claire this morning and for sharing some words of wisdom. And I um, hope everything goes well. I hope you have a great Christmas and thank you for your support and congratulations on your win with the Hill 5 Shiraz Cab. And, uh, yeah, we look forward to um, I look forward to getting down to your beautiful part of the world in the next couple of months, hopefully when all this jazz is under control. Yeah, no worries. Cheers. Uh, don't go away, Steve. I'll just be right back with you. 
And thanks everyone for dialing in and having a look around and joining us for this interview. I uh, hope uh, you've gained a few more insights into the beautiful uh, South Australian Clare Valley and the Barossa. And uh, be sure to watch us on the socials and follow us, subscribe to uh, the website at anzvws.com.au. Uh, results are out on the 1st of December, but this video will obviously be out uh, just after that. Uh, so stay tuned for more information and more episodes coming up.